Uh, the topic of uh, uh, this, this lecture is um, political entrepreneurship. And, uh, and the first thing uh, I want to do is to uh, um, introduce the topic as a, a contrast between uh, real market entrepreneurship and political entrepreneurship, uh, two different things. And, uh, and there is some literature in, um, in economics in the, in the sub-discipline of public choice that talks about, um, uses the word anyway, political entrepreneurship, uh, but they don't use it uh, always in the same way that, that I would because they, uh, they sort of try to uh, model political entrepreneurs as similar to uh, market entrepreneurs, real free market entrepreneurs, business people. And, uh, and what I'm going to have to say is that uh, there's a radical difference. In fact, it's just the inverse. Uh, as far as uh, the implications for economic performance, it's, it's just the opposite. A political <coughs> entrepreneur is, is the very opposite of a market entrepreneur, even though every once in a while you could find some uh, very transparent similarities. Uh, like you might find the mayor of a city who is fed up with uh, the bad quality water supply provided by the public works department and contracts out to a private company and does something good. But that's the exception that proves the rule that politicians generally are, are entrepreneurial in a very different way. And, and basically, you know, a market entrepreneur, uh, to succeed, uh, basically has to cater to the consumer. The consumer is king. If, uh, uh, one of my favorite passages in uh, Human Action by von Mises is uh, his, uh, in his chapter, uh, Discussion of the Consumer, uh, where he talks about us as consumers as hard-hearted and callous. He uses those words, hard-hearted and callous, meaning if you find a pair of sneakers that is marginally better than the one you've been uh, buying for the past five years, you'll dump that brand and you'll take the new brand immediately, or if it's cheaper. And so, you know, we'll drop that old company on a dime if we can save a few pennies, uh, or, or if it's a you know, very tiny difference in quality, and, uh, you know, on a whim. And, and, that's, and that's a good thing for the economy. And so entrepreneurs to succeed have to be uh, dil diligent in uh, constantly cost-cutting, product improving, trying to find out what we want as consumers, and, and generally creating wealth, creating wealth. Uh, they, they basically get the inputs, land, labor, capital, ideas, uh, and so forth. And to be successful, they have to transform the value of those inputs into something that consumers value more highly than what they paid for the inputs. That's how, they, that's how value is created in the economy. <laughs> Political entrepreneurs, basically are involved in the whole game of rent-seeking, to use the public choice term, and transferring wealth to themselves uh, and power to themselves uh, and to their supporters. And so they're basically involved in wealth destruction, uh, the whole process of politics, of trying to secure a wealth transfer to yourself or to your group under the auspices of the state, is a wealth-destroying because the opportunity cost of that kind of behavior is production. You know, if you weren't in, involved in politics, you would be involved in producing something or other. This is a very old libertarian theme that there are only two ways to make money. One, produce goods or services for your fellow man uh, and persuading them to buy them from you. Or two, using the power of the state to force money out of the pockets of one group uh, and into the pockets of your group or of you personally. Those are the only two ways to, to secure money uh, uh, legally. Of course, you can secure money illegally, uh, but that's, and that's the latter form is what uh, Friedrich Bastiat called legal plunder. That's a, that's a great term, legal plunder, uh, you know, lobbying for, for special benefits. And so uh, when you look at political entrepreneurs, uh, I've done a, a great deal of research on this over the years. I've written several books on, that go under the category of uh, political entrepreneurship. Uh, there's there's a, a constant struggle to do the opposite of what a market entrepreneur would do. A market entrepreneur, to be successful, has to please the consumer. A political entrepreneur is someone who, who works diligently at isolating himself from the pressures that can be put on him <clears throat> by the taxpayers. If we're talking politics, we're not talking consumers, we're about voters, taxpayers. You know, some of the literature calls them taxpayers slash voters. And so if you're really, really good at isolating yourself from any kind of pressure that can be brought on you by the voters, you're a successful political entrepreneur. 
As, as our friend Bob Higgs once told me, uh, the government allows us to have free speech in America because they know it doesn't really matter you know, what, what we say. They've done such a good job at isolating themselves uh, electorally from any kind of pressure we could put on them in Congress, for example, that they don't care what we say. Let us go rant and rave and, and everything. Or as Gary North once said, uh, uh, you cannot fight City Hall, but you can pee on the steps and run away. That's a, that's a Gary North quote. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, and, and so, but they both expressed sort of the same, the same thing. And, uh, and uh, so one example, I'm going to give some examples of some of the things I've written about political entrepreneurship to, to demonstrate this. Uh, I had an, an article in uh, the Review of Austrian Economics in uh, 1987, one of the second issue of the whole uh, journal uh, on this, if anybody's interested in digging it up. But uh, I also wrote a book with James Bennett entitled Underground Government. And uh, the, the subtitle is The Off-Budget Public Sector. And uh, what, what this was about was uh, there, there was a tax revolt in the, in the United States in the 1970s, and there were dozens of states that um, passed referenda uh, to uh, limit taxes, limit spending, and limit borrowing. Uh, the most famous uh, in the news media was called Proposition 13 in California, where they limited the increase in property taxes in California. But there were several dozen other states that did this in the mid to late 70s uh, when, you know, government, it was sort of a time when government was truly out of control. And it, that's, what, that's what led to the election of Ronald Reagan in, uh, in 1980. Uh, but it was a state level phenomenon too, as, as in addition to the, the federal government being out of control. Uh, but, uh, and so uh, my co-author, James Ben and I, uh, we wrote a book on um, how politicians res responded to this. Uh, the, sort of the classical theory of democracy would say that the people have spoken, they have passed referenda in, in huge margins to limit taxes, limit spending, limit borrowing, and the classical theory of democracy is sort of like a perfect competition model of government. The, the, the politicians wanting to be reelected re will do what the voters want, what the median voter wants anyway. The, the, you know, that's where the most votes are, the median, middle of the road voters in terms of political preferences. And, uh, and so we've documented in this book that uh, no politicians uh, all over the country and in other countries, we even had a chapter on England, how this worked in England, uh, uh, did the opposite. They would say to the voters, okay, yes, we will comply, but then at the same time, they would continue spending, but spending off the books, off budget. And they devised all sorts of means to hide spending off the books or off budget by creating what we called, uh, we, we coined the phrase off-budget enterprises, which we called OBEs in, in this book. And uh, to give you an idea of what they do at the local level of government, we, we had a case study of uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who was the, uh, the former governor of New York State, uh, who... Uh, then became uh, vice president of the United States. But as governor of New York State, he was a big spending, he was the kind of guy that Paul Krugman would love. It, he just could not spend enough of other people's money. And, uh, and there were, he wanted to build uh, uh, a gigantic university system uh, that would uh, be superior to California's. Uh, he wanted to build uh, public housing in every neighborhood. He had just grandiose plans for public building of everything. And his referenda would be turned down three or four or five times uh, uh, at times. Because, you know, to, to issue debt at the state level, they have a kind of debt called general obligation bonds, which means the taxpayers are obligated to pay the principal and interest. And so when they have a referenda uh, on a, at the state level on something like this, that's what they're voting on. Are, they, are you you're voting to tax yourself to, to finance in the future uh, you know, the building of dormitories or something like that. Time after time, they were turned down. And so uh, Rockefeller hired um, a man named John Mitchell, who uh, would later uh, be involved in the Watergate scandal as the Attorney General of the United States. But he was a bond counsel. He was a, a bond market lawyer at the time. And he invented something called the Moral Obligation Bond and it said uh, there's no legal obligation of the taxpayers of New York to pay off the principal and interest, but they have a moral obligation. And, and that was sort of a wink-wink to the bond market that we'll find the money somehow. If you, if you market these bonds for us, 
we'll come up with the money. And so they did. They issued these bonds, and these were generally are called revenue bonds. And uh, those are the two kind of bonds that state and local governments issue, general obligation and revenue. Revenue bonds do not require uh, voter approval. And so they issued uh, billions of dollars of these things, and the end result was New York State was bankrupted. Uh, it had a, a federal bailout. There was a federal government bailout, you know, long before the bailout of the, the, the you know, of the Bush-Obama years. Uh, the federal government had to bail out New York State because they were, they were bankrupt. And, uh, and Rocky, as he was known, uh, was mostly responsible for it. And the, the, the uh, non-voter approved debt of New York State was several times, I think it was three and a half times the, the voter approved debt of New York State. And so, uh, and, and so all of this debt that was off, off the books financed things that the, the public had, had no control whatsoever over. And so it was one big pork barrel of giving out of contracts to political, politically favored companies that would then kick back the money to the politicians, and, uh, and that's how it works. And at the same time, when this book came out, we got a lot of publicity because the largest bankruptcy in the history of municipal finance in America occurred and uh, it was uh, something out in the western part of the country that was known as WHOOPS. It, uh, this was the acronym, Washington Public Power Supply System. Oh, okay, I'm gonna push, I'm gonna hit the camera here. Uh, WHOOPS, um, Washington Public Power Supply System. They wanted to build nuclear power plants in the uh, northwest of America and, uh, and the same thing happened. They couldn't get voter approval. So here's the democratic process. We took a referenda, uh, and the voters said, no thanks. We don't want five nuclear power plants uh, out here in, in Washington state and uh, in surrounding states. Uh, so they issued uh, revenue bonds uh, to build it anyway. And, uh, and James Bennett and I wrote about what a fiasco it was. It ended up... Uh, only one of them ever being finished. Uh, the rest of them were almost built and then scrapped. They defaulted on two and a half billion dollars in in debt, and it was it was a, it was a big uh, a big disaster for everyone involved in the whole thing. And of course, and of course, the reason was that you know government is inefficient inherently to begin with, but these were even exceptionally inefficient enterprises because there was no 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 uh, taxpayer involvement at all. It was all the bond lawyers, the Wall Street bankers, and the construction companies, and the politicians, and uh, the, the voters had nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, at least once in a while, they can uh, exert some kind of discipline just by knowing what is going on. But uh, and so, and so, Ben and I wrote this whole book, Underground Government, to document uh, this type of political entrepreneurship, and it's all aimed at escaping control by. The, uh, your agents, you know, supposedly you have a principal agent uh, situation here where the politicians are the principals, uh, uh, or, the, or the agents rather, and the, and the voters are the principals. They're supposed to be acting in their best interest in theory, but, uh, but of course they don't. Another, another example of this is another book that Bennett and I wrote way back when. It was called Destroying Democracy. Hold your applause, please. Uh, and uh, and uh, where I got the idea for this title, Destroying Democracy, was uh, a famous essay by James Madison, his essay number 10 in uh, the Federalist Papers, where Madison said that the whole purpose of the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, was to restrain the violence of faction. And by that he meant special interest group politics. And uh, what this book is about is uh, Bennett and I got a hold of a large database of uh, government funding, government grants, to non-profit organizations of all kinds, everything from environmental groups to labor unions to uh, uh, groups that lobbied for a bigger welfare state, uh, the military industrial complex, the whole ball of wax. And, uh, and uh, we argued uh, and we showed in a big fat book uh, about this thick that um, not only does government fail to restrain the violence of faction, but it finances the violence of faction. It, it would give grants to these uh, nonprofit organizations with uh, ostensibly nice-sounding purposes to alleviate poverty, to, uh, to help the elderly find rental housing, uh, uh, 
to cure the heartbreak of psoriasis, whatever, you know, all, all sorts of uh, nice sounding purposes. But then the money would be used to hire lobbyists and to lobby the government for, uh, for, uh, for higher taxes and more spending. So the government was paying people to twist its arm, twist the government's arm to increase its power in, in revenue, uh, in other words. So it's kind of a farcical thing, but that's, that's what was done and is still being done today. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so again, this was a way in which, uh, you know, if you think in terms of the classical theory of democracy that says that uh, politicians respond to the will of the people, uh, while the will is largely a manufactured will to the extent that this sort of thing takes place, that the government is actually funding all of these groups that, uh, that are responsible for the, the, a lot of the propaganda about government that you hear in the news media uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, you, you, and to understand how this works, you have to understand that the American welfare state is not administered by the government. It's funded by the government. But the U.S. government created hundreds of nonprofit organizations to administer the welfare state. And at the same time, it, it made sure that these groups uh, use uh, tax dollars to lobby for a, 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 an expansion of the welfare state year in and year out. So it's not just handing out welfare money that uh, these uh, nonprofit organizations are involved in. It's they're they're, poli they're political. They're very political about it, and they're a, a very powerful lobbying force for an ever expanding state. And so, uh, so once again, politicians use this vehicle to isolate themselves from. Um, taxpayer pressure, and that's, that's being entrepreneurial in exactly the opposite way of a real entrepreneur who has to persuade consumers to hand over their money to, uh, to, uh, to get their goods. Okay. Uh, another book that Ben and I wrote on this theme is called Official Lies. The, sub the subtitle is uh, How Washington Misleads Us. In, uh, and this was sort of a natural follow-up to destroying democracy because uh, uh, we wrote, you know, chapter and verse. We documented how the government lies about just about everything. Um, for, I'll just give you a few anecdotes. Uh, when the government issues poverty statistics about the, the distribution of income and how unequal it is, the U.S. government, when it when it uh, issues these statistics on uh, on the distribution of income, it does not take taxes out of the higher end. It, it just gives the, the gross income of the higher end income earners, gross income, and on the lower end of income earners, it does not add government benefits. So people who receive maybe twenty or $30,000 a year versus of cash and in-kind government benefits, none of that is counted as their income. And the people who pay for it, none of the taxes taken out of their income uh, is subtracted when they issue these statistics on how unequal the distribution of income is. And so, of course, it's going to look uh, greatly, greatly skewed. Uh, and we cite uh, uh, an economist, uh, Edgar Browning, who did a lot of real good work on uh, welfare state statistics uh, about 20 years ago, is showing, for example, that um, just in the, the poverty rate, you might hear the government say, well, the poverty rate in America is 10%. Well, the government just arbitrarily establishes a number of what poverty income is. I think it's around $20,000 a year this year, something like that. If you make less than that, you're in poverty. And, uh, and so, but, but they don't count any of the benefits that you get from the government. So you can make $19,000 a year and then receive $35,000 a year worth of government benefits, and you're officially in poverty. Uh, and, uh, but Browning calculated that if you do that, if you count the government benefits, then uh, the real poverty rate is more like 2 or 3% and not 13%, as the government would say. Uh, we have a chapter on the farm subsidies, for example. And the image that Americans get about farm subsidies is that they help the family farm. Uh, we, we talked about, we have a chapter that discusses uh, congressional hearings on this and, and about how. Uh, uh, when the new farm bill was up for uh, revision at the time we were writing the book, uh, the Congress brought in as an expert witness the, the uh, actress Sissy Spacek because she had just portrayed a farm wife in a movie and she appeared before Congress and cried, you know, tears are coming. She's an actress. She's crying about the, <laughs> the, the poor little family farmer. Uh, and, and so um, 
And so, but, but of course, the actual farm programs, most of them grant give subsidies based on acreage. So if you're a large corporate farm that's in the Fortune 500 and you have a million acres, you get a lot more money from the government than some, some guy out here in, in uh, East Alabama who has a 100-acre farm and, and might also apply for the same benefit. But if it's by acres or acreage, uh, that, so the lion's share of the farm subsidies go to big corporations who, of course, then kick back some of the money to the, to the politicians who are responsible for giving them the, the subsidies in the form of legalized bribery called campaign donations. That's what they call it. You know, the mafia would call it you know, something different, but it's essentially the same thing uh, that's, that's going on. And so that's the sort of thing we did in this book, Official Lies. Uh, but again, it's, it's the manipulation of public opinion uh, that is out there. And the government uh, does have the ability to drown out almost all of their voices uh, on when it comes, when it wants to, because it has so many resources at its disposal and so many court historians and, and others who echo the, the government line on things because one way or another, they're rewarded for it. Uh, you know, one, one of my articles on the whole Lincoln stuff uh, was a review, for example, of a book by Doris Kearns Goodwin called Team of Rivals. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Goodwin was, was kicked off of the Pulitzer Prize Committee. She was kicked off of PBS. Uh, you know, she was a talking head on PBS because she had confessed to plagiarism and she confessed to paying the person she plagiarized from $100,000 uh, out of court settlement in one of her books. And so, uh, but, but, when, but when you're a court historian, you see, she's written uh, uh, a book about how great Lyndon Johnson was, another book about how great the Kennedy family was. And so, uh, so she's a real darling of the state. She writes books that sort of help to prop up the state. So she was kicked off and sort of disgraced for about three months. And then she's back on television and she was given a big book contract to read, to write this book on Lincoln. And uh, Steven Spielberg is making a movie about it now. So if you're, if you're a liar for the state, you can get away with anything. You can even admit to plagiarizing hundreds of pages of somebody else's work, and that's fine. No problem at all. You're back in, you're back in getting uh, uh, you know, uh, half-million-dollar book contracts, and, and they make movies out of your books. Uh, but that, that's how it works. Uh, that's what I meant when I said it's not just the state, but it's the, the, a lot of people who benefit from being associated with the state who spread these lies uh, about the state. Okay, and so, uh, so these are all th three examples of what I'm talking about. We're talking about how politicians work diligently to uh, isolate themselves from the pressure of their, their principles, so their supposed principles, which are the taxpayers and the voters. Uh, now, another uh, aspect of this is uh, if you look at the behavior of political entrepreneurs versus market entrepreneurs, uh, another good illustration of this uh, that I've written about also in my research is um, the, rail the, um, the railroad industry in America. Uh, the, the, very, the very first large-scale funding in terms of corporate welfare of any kind of industry was the railroads in the, in the 1860s. Okay, prior to that, there had been some, some state governments had, uh, had uh, subsidized the building of canals and railroads, uh, but not much, not much, not much money. In fact, it was such a fiasco uh, uh, in the early 19th century that by the time you get to 1860, on the eve of the American Civil War, every state in America had amended its constitution uh, to make it uh, illegal to use tax dollars for any corporation for any purpose because it had been such a, such a fiasco. Uh, but then that all changed during the Civil War when the federal government stepped in and started uh, massively subsidizing railroad building and, and created the, the Central Pacific and, and the Union Pacific Railroads. And, and you, there was a nice contrast there because a little later in the 1870s, there was a man named James J. Hill who uh, was the, the founder of the Great Northern Railroad. And uh, one of the characters in Atlas Shrugged is uh, modeled after James J. Hill. Uh, yeah, the Ayn Rand novel. But um, he, wrote, he was the founder of the Great Northern. And uh, you can read about him. The best place to read about him, there's a great book. 
a great book on uh, political entrepreneurship by Burton Folsom. It's called um, The Myth of the Robber Barons. And there's a chapter on James J. Hill. And, uh, and this is a real stark contrast between Hill and uh, who was a real market entrepreneur and the political entrepreneurs who ran the, the government subsidized railroads. And basically, I'll draw you a map here. You know, I, already draw, I drew a map of the United States for you here to show you what was going on at the time. Here's America. <laughs> Right there, and, and here's um, Council Bluffs, Iowa. <clears throat> this, this was the uh, eastern terminus of the government subsidized railroad, and uh, it is also where in 1857 Abraham Lincoln invested in real estate. And then, when, when he signed the Pacific Railway Act in 1862. Uh, the, the act gave him the authority to decide where the eastern terminus was, and by sheer coincidence, I'm sure, uh, Honest Abe chose Council Bluffs, Iowa. And uh, so that's where the railroad started. And so the objective, of course, is to go to the, the west coast. They wanted a railroad so that all of the, the commerce from the east could go west and vice versa, the, you know, travel both ways, and the population could go out. They wanted to uh, populate the American west. And so... So they started building railroads, and the government subsidized railroads uh, took this kind of a route to, to the West Coast, something like that. And, uh, and, the, and the, reason, the reason for that was, since Congress was funding it, every member of Congress, even representatives of the territories that were not yet states, but who were there in Congress, and who were going to have political power as soon as New Mexico became a state, for example, uh, they had some influence too, and so every member of Congress uh, from that area said, well, you'll have my vote for the subsidy, but you have to run a line to my city, you know, my, in, in my, my area, whether it's economical to do, do that or not. And so there were appendages everywhere to all these places because that's how politics works. And so the political entrepreneurs that uh, ran the, uh, the, uh, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, the government railroads, uh, pretty much built the railroad lines like this, very, very inefficiently. And I could read to you um, some of the uh, examples of this that Burton Folsom uh, talks about. Let's see. Yeah, so they built, they, they really did build, you know, Burton Folsom says they, they built wide, uh, winding, circuitous routes to collect for more mileage. Well, the, the subsidies were per mile subsidies. And so, if you built it like this to go to California, it was more profitable. Whereas for James J. Hill, let's see, I'll, I'll draw another map. Here's another map of America. I'll call this the Hill map. There's, the, there's Florida, there's Texas. Okay. James J. Hill's route was pretty much like that because he was a businessman. He wasn't a political hack. He was a businessman. And uh, the only way he could make money was to find the most direct route, the cheapest route, he used the best materials for his rails uh, and so forth, and, and that's what he did. And so Hill became legendary. It's, it's, uh, his autobiography is called Highways of Progress. If you, if you want to read a, a really interesting biography by a really hardcore free trade uh, uh, enterpriser of the 19th century, I, I would recommend that one. He, was, uh, he brags in the biography that he never accepted a dime in government aid of any kind. He didn't accept land grants. Unlike the government railroads, uh, if he came across uh, Indian lands, he did not call in the army to murder all the Indians. He, he, uh, he, he uh, bartered with them with uh, livestock or money or whatever they could trade for, for rights of way uh, across their land. Uh, it, but it was the, the government uh, subsidized railroad that socialized the cost of building railroads. And part of the way of socializing the cost, that is forcing the taxpayers ultimately to pay the cost of building the railroads was instead of paying the Indians something, uh, they would just kill them all. In fact, the, the chief engineer of the, uh, the, the government railroads was a man named Grenville Dodge, 
who was a, a close uh, friend and confidant of Abraham Lincoln's. And during the war, the Civil War, Lincoln made Dodge a general, and his job was to kill Indians and make way for the uh, railroads. So he spent his time in the war killing Indians. And then after the war, Grenville Dodge recommended to the government that they make slaves of the Indians and, and, and make the Indians dig the railroad beds from Iowa to California. Uh, the government chose not to do that. It chose to kill them instead. And so uh, uh, if you want to read about it, uh, go to the Independent Review and read my article about it in the last fall issue of the Independent Review. It's on independent.org is the website. And you can find it. Just type my name in there. And so, uh, but James J. Hill couldn't do that because he wasn't government subsidized. He competed with these people. He competed with them. And so um, uh, I'll give you some example of political entrepreneurship that uh, Burton Folsom writes about. Of, of how it worked out. Now here's Grenville Dodge, the chief engineer of the, the railroad. So he's, you know, he's, a, he's a big guy. He's the chief engineer of the government's transcontinental railroads, uh, of which many books have been written. He says, since Dodge was in a hurry, he laid track on the ice and snow. Naturally, the line had to be rebuilt in the spring. So here they are in the Rocky Mountains, and there's 10 feet of ice pack, and they get people to build railroad tracks on top of the ice pack, then when the spring thaw comes, it collapses, but they make double the money. They got to build it again. So they, they make double the money. It's, either government, it's like, you know, dig a hole and, and fill it up again. Dig a hole and fill it up again. That, you know, it was the original public works project. Uh, and he goes on to say, what was worse, unanticipated spring flooding along the lower fork. Who would, who would unanticipate spring flooding in the Rocky Mountains uh, of the Platte River? Wash, washed out rails, bridges, and telephone poles, doing at least $50,000 damage in the first year. No wonder some observers estimated the actual building cost at almost three times what it, it should have been. Okay, and he goes on to say, the subsidized railroads routinely use more gunpowder blasting their way through the mountains and forests on a single day than was used during the entire Battle of Gettysburg in the Civil War. So, on a single, so if you can imagine that, they just blasted their way through, uh, through the mountains, through the Rocky Mountains. And, uh, and here's another classic example of uh, political entrepreneurship. One of, the, one of the real robber barons, I mean, there were real robber barons. It was these guys. It was Grenville Dodge and another man named Thomas Durant uh, who, were the, who ran this. They were the political entrepreneurs. Uh, James J. Hill was not a robber baron. He didn't rob anybody. He was a market entrepreneur. And here's another passage from Folsom about the Union Pacific. In 1866, Thomas Durant wined and dined 150 prominent citizens, including senators and ambassador and government bureaucrats, along a complicated section of the railroad. He hired an orchestra, a caterer, six cooks, a magician, and then he has in parentheses, to pull subsidies out of a hat, question mark, and, <laughs> and, and, and a photographer. For those with ecumenical palates, he served Chinese duck and Roman goose. The more adventurous were offered roast, ox, and antelope. All could have expensive wine and for dessert, strawberries, peaches, and cherries. After dinner, some of the men hunted buffalo from their coaches. Durant hoped that all would go back to Washington and Klein to repay the Union Pacific for its hospitality. So it was whining and dining and lobbying was the focus of these political entrepreneurs. And then if you read about what James J. Hill did, on the other hand, uh, Here's what Folsom says, under his direction, the workers began laying rails twice as quickly as the Northern Pacific crews had, the other government subsidized railroad. Um, Hill passed on his cost reductions to his customers in the form of lower rates because he knew that uh, farmers, miners, timber interests, and others who used his railroad services would succeed or fail along with him. His motto was, we have got to prosper with you or we have got to be poor with you. So he understood that the, the farmers and timber interests and anybody who lived out there and worked out there, uh, they had to prosper. He gave the, he gave the farmers free seed grain and even cattle. Uh, he had uh, contests for raising the biggest cows and in the, in the, in the, in things like that to encourage uh, farmers. Uh, and, and he dropped his rates steadily. Uh, Burton Folsom writes that uh, James J. Hill, quote, gloried in the role of rate slasher and disruptor of price-fixing pooling agreements. So here's the government subsidized railroads conspiring to fix prices, and James J. Hill comes along and, and enjoyed uh, the heck out of uh, dropping prices 
in foiling the, uh, the uh, attempt to fix prices. Uh, one more quote about James J. Hill from Burton Folsom. He said, says, Hill's quest for short routes, low grades, and few curvatures was an obsession. In 1889, he, Hill conquered the Rocky Mountains by finding the legendary Marias Pass. Lewis and Clark had described a low pass through the Rockies back in 1805, but later no one seemed to know whether it really existed or if it did where it was. Hill wanted the best gradient so much that he hired a man to spend months searching western Montana for this legendary pass. He did, in fact, find it, and the ecstatic hill shortened his route by almost 100 miles. And so that's how we ended up having his route more or less like this compared to uh, the, the, uh, the government-subsidized railroads that were, that were built like that. Okay. And uh, Folsom concludes that the Great Northern was the best constructed and most profitable of all, of all the world's major railroads, not just America's, but the world's uh, major railroads. And so that's the stark difference between uh, political entrepreneurship and, and market entrepreneurship. Uh, another element of, uh, of uh, political entrepreneurship comes from uh, another book that I would, uh, that's very interesting. I think it's an important book. Uh, in this whole area, let's see, where is it? And it's, it's written by my old friend, Fred McChesney, and it's called Money for Nothing. Published by Harvard University Press. And what this is about is a, it's a book about a category of government regulation uh, that doesn't seem you can't does seem to have any special interest group behind it. Uh, McChesney, he, who uh, the last I was in touch with him, I haven't seen him in a couple of years. He was a law professor at Northwestern, uh, but um, uh, there's a category of regulation that didn't seem to have any lobbying group lobbying for the regulation. It seems to come directly from Congress. But normally, when you see any kind of regulation being proposed, there's somebody who might have spent years lobbying Congress to, to issue the regulation or the legislation. Uh, but, but there's a category out there that there's no identifiable special interest group. And so he wrote a whole book about, about this of, uh, you know, why? why? Why does this type of regulation come about? And it's essentially political blackmail. Uh, he, he has, there are categories of bills that congressional staffers in Washington, D.C. refer to as milker bills, milk as in the stuff you drink, milker bills. They sometimes call them juicer bills, milker and juicer bills. And so, so what are they milking and what are they juicing? Uh, they're, they're milking campaign contributions. The idea is the, the, the Congress will propose a very onerous and, and uh, tax increase on a particular industry or a very onerous regulation, price controls on pharmaceuticals, for example, and uh, that would cost that industry billions of dollars. And then members of Congress will sit back to be bribed with campaign contributions to, to, uh, to undo the legislation, to, to make sure that it doesn't pass, that the price control law does not go into effect. And there seems to be a cycle for this in McChesney's book that the closer you get to the election, the next election, the more frequent you see milker bills and juicer bills. Okay, you know, juicer bills are uh, said, called that because they're designed to squeeze cash out of corporate coffers in return for not harming the corporations with uh, legislation and regulation. Um, and you know, one example he gives, uh, I'll read just one example of what this is about. Um, Yeah, well, during the Clinton administration, they, they proposed price controls on pharmaceuticals. And so the pharmaceuticals uh, industry uh, poured millions of dollars into both parties in Washington, D.C. And uh, let's see, I think he has, he has the amounts here. Oh, there's uh, Representative Jim Cooper, who proposed legislation uh, for price controls, received nearly $1 million in campaign contributions just from the pharmaceutical industry in the first four months of 1994, which was a congressional election year. Overall, campaign contributions in that year were about one-third higher than the previous non-election year. 
And then, then of course, they dropped it. They dropped the proposal. After they collected the millions, they dropped the, uh, the price control proposal. And so, and so that's, that's uh, what McChesney means about um, money for nothing, uh, you know, the title of his book. It's, it's just extortion. It's a form of extortion. And, uh, and so uh, and that's, that's being entrepreneurial in a, in a political sense. It's, it's just the opposite of the market sense. You know, business people in the marketplace can't do this. They can't threaten to sell you poison unless you pay them twice for the hot dog that you're going to buy from, from them. But the government does. It, threat, it can threaten to harm you unless you, uh, you give them, them, the politicians, more money. Uh, another illustration of what I mean by political entrepreneurship is how it is that uh, uh, the Congress has uh, created a, a monopolistic system of government in the U.S., And uh, what this is, these are bar charts that show uh, just what it says, re-election rates over the years. The, the top one is the House of Representatives, and the bottom one is the United States Senate. And these are kind of small numbers, but uh, this is, right here is 90%, right, right, right there. And so if you look at, you know, since in the first year here, this is uh, 1964, okay, 2010, okay. And so if you look at this whole this time period, you know, over 90% of all members of the House of Representatives get, get reelected. So for all practical purposes, once you're elected to Congress, uh, it's, it's pretty much impossible uh, to be unseated to lose your seat. You, you have to be really, really, really bad to, to lose your seat. Um, uh, a few of you in the room might remember about about I don't know, it was 12 or 15 years ago now, uh, Congressman Barney Frank uh, was in a, had a, involved in a scandal. He's still in Congress, uh, but uh, it was in the, the front page of the Washington Post for a whole week that um, his partner uh, that he lived with was running a, uh, a house of prostitution out of the basement of his townhouse in Washington, D.C., and Congressman Frank claimed he knew nothing about it. And uh, so, so imagine this, you live in a small townhouse, you know, not a real big giant you know, mansion, a townhouse, and there are people coming and going all night long, and, and Lord knows what kind of noise they're making in the basement, and you know, and you know nothing about it, nothing about it. And so uh, anyway, he, he, nothing happened to him. It, you know, so you can even run a whorehouse as a member of Congress and still get reelected. Uh, uh, well, I grew up in, in western Pennsylvania, and there was a congressman named Flood, and uh, he looked just like Snidely Whiplash in the Bullwinkle cartoons. If, if you ever watched those old cartoons, Bullwinkle and Rocky, Snidely Whiplash had a handlebar mustache, and he wore a, a black cape, and he had this big black hat. Flood dressed exactly like that. He had a handlebar mustache with wax on it, and he, wore a, he walked around in a black cape. And, and he, was, he was convicted of a felony, but uh, Pennsylvania law at the time said uh, he appealed, and until the appeal was decided, he could still run again, and he was reelected, even though he'd been, he's on his way to jail, apparently, but he was, he was reelected, and I can remember uh, newspapers interviewing people saying, why did you vote for this guy? He's a crook. And people would typically say, well, they're all crooks in Washington, but ours is really good at bringing grants back home to our district for, you know, to build schools and post offices and all that stuff. And, uh, and my brother-in-law worked for two years building the post office down there. And so, uh, but it's not just that. Uh, you know, one of the reasons for this, and the Senate is not much different. If you look at the Senate, uh, yeah, there's, there's some more dips in the Senate, but still it looks like the average is, is around 80%. Incumbency re-election rate, at least 80 to 85%. Is, uh, well, one of the things is there's, there's a proliferation of subcommittees, and each subcommittee, the purpose of which is to, uh, to dole out uh, government spending benefits to various special interest groups. And so challengers can't compete with that. Challengers can't promise farmers and construction companies and uh, the aerospace industry multi-million dollar contracts, but you can if you're a member of Congress because you're on the subcommittee that doles out those contracts. And so there's a proliferation of that. There's a proliferation of staff members paid for by the taxpayers who are essentially permanent campaign workers for you, paid for by taxpayers. 
Whereas if you're a challenger trying to run for Congress, you have to come up with the money on your own to pay for people to work for you or to ask them to volunteer to work, to, to work for you. So that makes it tough. But uh, another thing that makes it uh, especially tough is gerrymandering. Uh, this word comes from a combination of a, 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 a 18th century politician named Elbridge Jerry and the word salamander. And, uh, and what this is, is uh, the drawing, maybe I'll draw my own map first, the drawing of districts. Like, say, say I'll draw, say this is the state of Alabama here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and let's say there are, there are several congressional districts. You could make the districts like this. And here's one, two, three, four. Four congressional districts. So four members of Congress, uh, let's say. Or, here's the state of Alabama again. You could draw them kind of like this. They could look kind of kind of like that. <laughs> so something like that. And, uh, which, which they actually do. Here's, here's the actual map of uh, congressional districts in Alabama. Now, like, look at this one. I'll, I'll draw it in black. This is a congressional district. Okay, now, now, why would it be like that? Um, well, what they do is they find out uh, who, the, every 10 years when the census is taken, if, if there happens to be a Democratic governor in Alabama, the Democratic Party gets to redraw the congressional districts on a map. And so they'll look at this area and they'll decide, well, there's 80% Democrats in this, area, this particular area right here. So that's a congressional district. And then, uh, and so you know, this one here is, is different. You know, they're all you know, different. Uh, and so, so that's what they do. And the, and the Republicans will do the same thing when they're in. And so the congressional districts in America are drawn up so that a Republican district will typically have 70 or 80% Republican voters, which means uh, whoever the Republican is, is gonna win. And the same with the Democrats. They'll have 70, 80, 90% Democrat voters in that particular district. So it's guaranteed uh, that no matter who the Democrat candidate is, the is gonna win in that one. And so, uh, as re and that's one of the reasons why no matter what you do, you, it's almost impossible to lose your seat in Congress. And so we have a largely a monopoly government. That's why uh, Bob Higgs says things like, they let us have free speech because it doesn't really matter. You know, they let us talk and they, and they, they put us on television and all these things, but, uh, but they, they really know it doesn't matter. They don't, they don't pay attention to what we do anymore at the, at the federal level. And so when people like Tom Woods and myself make uh, the case for nullification uh, of federal laws or its secession, uh, this is why. You know, we've tried all this business of electing the right people and you know, electoral politics, but this is why it doesn't work. They've, they've rigged the system so much uh, over the years through all this political entrepreneurship that we, we have a monopoly government, centralized monopoly government, and they do do whatever they want. American presidents can bomb anybody now without asking anybody else, can't they? Uh, do you remember when uh, Bill Clinton bombed uh, an, what turned out to be an aspirin factory in the Sudan uh, and uh, everybody mocked it when the Sudanese said, oh, it's an aspirin factory. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ter it's a terrorist training camp, uh, Clinton said. He did that on the exact day that Monica Lewinsky was testifying before a grand jury, his, his girlfriend, uh, you know, if you remember the, the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So American presidents can lob bombs at an innocent country and kill innocent people just to divert the American media away from their personal problems. And that's monopoly power there. And nothing happened to Clinton. He got, uh, he got higher popularity ratings um, after that because people thought he was, he was protecting us from terrorists. Uh, and they probably still do uh, to this day. But, um, okay, so that's um, uh, my other example of um, uh, political entrepreneurship, the incumbency racket. And, uh, of course, there are other types of gimmicks that government plays to, uh, to get its way, and one is uh, log rolling. I'll mention two more gimmicks. Log rolling, then I might have time for a few questions. And uh, I'll give you an example of log rolling. Let's, see, let's say we have three different groups of preferences, A, B, and C. 
Group A wants more spending on schools, but none on hospitals. So there are two things that a local government is doing, education, schooling, and hospitals. Uh, group B wants more hospitals, but no school spending. So for example, people in group A might be uh, young, young parents who want more spending on schools for their kids, but since they're pretty healthy, they don't want to spend more tax dollars on hospitals. Group B is people who are older and are more concerned about their health, their kids are out of school, so they don't want to vote for increased taxes on more schools, uh, but they'll vote for increased taxes for, uh, to add a new wing to the local public hospital, okay? Group C uh, wants no more of anything, either schools or hospitals. And so let's say these are three equally numbered groups you know, in, a, in a community, same number of voters, and we take a majority rule vote on school spending. Okay, will we get a majority vote on school spending? On spending more on schools? When, if we need two out of three? No, we won't. We only have one out of three uh, that, would, that would do that. You only, you'd only get a third of the votes. And the same is true of hospitals. If you took a referendum, should we spend more on hospitals? You'd only get one third. Uh, you, only, you only get uh, this group here, and the other two would vote no. And so uh, the will of the majority would be no more spending on anything. You couldn't get a majority on anything. But what log rolling is, is group A, or the politicians representing group A, can cut a deal with group base, uh, B, saying, uh, you know, we don't give a crap about hospital spending, but we will vote for more hospital spending today if uh, next month we take another referendum on school spending. And we understand that you don't care about school spending but uh, that's the price you're going to have to pay if you want us to vote for your hospital spending. And so that's log rolling or vote trading. And so e what this means is that even though the, the true preferences of the majority are no more spending on anything, the end result is more spending on everything by the government through, uh, through log rolling. Okay. And so this, this is one example of what's meant by log rolling or vote trading. And the final thing, the final gimmick I'll mention, we're kind of running out of time here, is what's called in the public choice literature agenda control. Uh, political entrepreneurs can determine the outcome of elections by controlling how the vote is taken, how the, the agenda of, of the vote, uh, uh, you know, the timing of the vote, and, and, and what it is you're voting on. And, uh, and one, now one example of this, uh, I'll give you a real world example that sticks in my mind. Uh, uh, I, lived, I lived in Buffalo, New York for one year, and that was enough for me. It, was, it, it starts snowing in Buffalo around August, and it snows all day long and all night every day until May. That's the, at least it did the year I lived there. And, and there's about a 50 mile an hour wind that goes along with it too at all times. And it's very, very pleasant sleeping at night because all you can hear is snow plows going back and forth all night long everywhere in, in the city. And, uh, but anyway, uh, they, they, uh, that one year they, they had three school spending referenda that were defeated. You know, the, the county the schools kept proposing spending more money for schools and it kept getting voted down. And so uh, they, they announced that, well, if you're not gonna give us more money, we're gonna have to cut out school buses. And in Buffalo, New York, uh, during the school year, most of the school year, there are no sidewalks because there are, there's snow eight feet high on the sidewalks. And so they're pretty much saying, your kids are going to walk to school on the street in the dark in the morning uh, if, we don't have, uh, if we don't have our tax increase. And so they took a fourth vote, and of course it passed. And so that's, that's an example of uh, what is meant by, by agenda control in, in votes. Um, this, this kind of trick or this phenomenon is also sometimes referred to as the Washington Monument Syndrome. And uh, uh, whenever governments are, uh, can't get their way uh, in terms of increased spending, uh, the first thing they cut out is ambulance service, police, garbage collection, whatever will impose the biggest, uh, biggest harm on the public. Uh, and it's always unnecessary to do this, but that's what they do. And it's called the Washington Monument Syndrome because it became famous in the 1960s when the, the head of the National Park Service 
went to Congress and asked for a budget increase, and they turned him down. And so uh, his response was to close down the Washington Monument, which was the most, is the most popular tourist attraction in, in, in Washington, D.C. Families from each state come on vacation to Washington, D.C., and the one thing they want to do is to go up to the top of the Washington Monument. And so members of Congress were deluged with phone calls from angry constituents saying, you know, we came all the way from Montana to Washington, D.C. for our family vacation, our once-a-year vacation, to see the Washington Monument, and it closed down. And so uh, that was enough to get the Congress to change its vote and give the National Park Service the money it wanted. And so uh, st federal, state, and local governments routinely do this all the time when they're threatened with not getting their way, is they always try to inflict the most severe punishment possible on the public by not collecting the garbage or letting crime go uh, run amok uh, or no ambulance services, sorry, if you have a heart attack, you know, call your brother-in-law, uh, you know, don't ask, don't call us. Uh, the schools, they shut down the schools, uh, you know, and inconvenience all the parents. And so, and that's a form of agenda control. It's a form of agenda control. And so all of this is a, is a way in which uh, political entrepreneurs isolate themselves from pressure uh, of their, from their, their principles. You know, and uh, I don't know, Peter Klein, probably talked about, or he will, if he has another talk on the principal agent problem in economics, where, you know, in a corporation, the, uh, the uh, principals or the stockholders, the agents or the corporate managers in politics, the principals are the voters and taxpayers, the agents are supposedly are politicians. And so, uh, but in the corporate world, we have mechanisms in the market to get to force our agents to work for us the market for corporate control, competition um, among firms, and so forth. But in government, that doesn't exist. You don't have that. It's, it's a non-market institution. And so politicians have a lot more leeway uh, to do all these things, especially to lie to us uh, as far as that goes. You know, in the market, if a business person is known as a liar, uh, you don't go back. You know, if, if they tell you they're going to sell you an all-beef hot dog, and you take a bite into it, and it's a soybean hot dog, you don't go back, and he goes bankrupt. Uh, but if they tell you we have to bomb Iraq because they have weapons of mass destruction, they're going to hit New York City. Uh, they get away with it. They do it, uh, you know, we, because we don't have the market mechanism. Yeah. Uh, they can they can lie. Uh, you know, politicians can generally have a lot more latitude to lie to us than does the most dishonest used car salesman in the world. Uh, and uh, because of the difference in the institution. Okay, and I guess my time is almost up. Uh, uh, maybe we'll have time for one question since the man in the front asked, raised his hand. We have one minute left, I think. Fire, fire the, part, the head of the Park Service? Yeah. Oh, they have a lot of use for the, for the bureaucrats. Um, what, uh, one of the things they do with the bureaucrats is whenever things really do go wrong, they hold hearings and they call the bureaucrat up there and they point their finger and they criticize them and they make sure it's on television that he's responsible for the problem, not us. And so a lot of what happens is that the heads of these agencies will take the heat uh, for it. They'll be you know, severely chastised and trashed on, on camera, and, you know, on C-SPAN in, in these hearings. Uh, but it's all a charade. It's all a political theater. And then you'll find out they got a budget increase. But that's their payoff for taking the heat for the problems created by these institutions, created by the politicians. And so, so uh, that's that's one reason. Also, uh, people who have these jobs usually get these jobs because they have uh, powerful and wealthy supporters who got them a job. A job. So the members of Congress would have to take that person on or those persons on who got them the job in the first place. If you're the head of the National Park Service, you probably, you probably have the timber industry and the mining industry behind you because they, they lease a lot of land to timber and mining companies on the cheap. And so a member in the Congress uh, couldn't just willy-nilly fire that person without uh, uh, incurring the wrath of the timber and mining industries. So there's a cost, a political cost involved in doing that. But I guess our time is about up then. We'll, uh, we'll quit there.